International Master, Dr. Danny Kopeck, and I'm happy to be participating in another flash video lecture sponsored by ICC. Our topic today will be Rook and Pawn Endings, the most principled part of chess. By principled, I mean that you can actually learn Rook and Pawn Endings just by studying them and following principles that you can learn from practice, experience, and listening to me. These principles are very powerful, and it doesn't matter how excited your opponent gets, how much he or she bangs the pieces, the principles are what control the game. The first principle in Rook and Pawn Endings is that you must have an active rook. The rook being the most powerful piece involved in these endings is critical to the entire play that follows. I have broken down the study of rook and pawn endings into three essential factors. The activity of the rook, the activity of the king, and the activity of the pawns. If you take all the combinations of those three factors, you get eight categories, including no advantage for any of the factors. Now, in the current position in front of us, white has the all-important open file, the only open file in the position, the C file, and white's rook is on the seventh rank on that open file, on the C7 square. In effect, we call that seventh heaven. The rook cannot be attacked, cannot be removed, and should not move unless there is significant material gain to follow. In contrast, black's rook is totally passive on B8. So white has by far the better rook has a span on the open C file of seven squares that it attacks in addition to the square it's on and then on the seventh rank it hits all the black pawns on that rank either directly or indirectly so of course for example if black moves his B pawn the A pawn hangs in the position it's white to move, but it doesn't really matter. This is a position for study, for learning, for exercise, and for practice. And I've used it many times in my lectures with others participating as black, playing the black pieces for defensive purposes. And I think from the study of this position, people's play and understanding of rook and pawn endings significantly will improve. So, white has the better rook. He needs to get the better pawns and the better king. Either one, not necessarily in that order. For example, if white could put his king on the d6 square, boy, would that be something. Okay? That d6 square is a square that would be so dominant and white could then trade rooks in any ending that would result would be a one ending for white, a one king and pawn ending. So you see, rook and pawn endings bridge to king and pawn endings directly. And so you must know your king and pawn endings as well. And white having the dominant king in the king and pawn ending would be winning. Black, of course, for his part, cannot allow the white king, to reach the d6 square. So, white might essay his plan with king f1. And black, for his part, cannot do much. He might play king f8 to remove the, black, the back rank threat that might occur if his rook ever left the back rank. White will play king e2, Black can try to get some pawns off the 7th rank. Maybe a move like g5 is not a bad idea. 
White plays king to d3. It's not entirely clear what white is playing for. To black at this point, black may try to keep gaining some space on the king side with a move like h6 or h5. Now, white would continue the plan, which is to play king b4, king c5, king d6. In the meantime, there isn't really much black can do. Black can't move his f pawn very well, because then the white rook will be very dangerous, could play a move like rook h7, winning immediately. If black plays f6, for example, here, white could play rook h7, threatening check, winning the rook, and threatening the pawn. So, black will not do that. Black will maybe continue on a passive plan on the, well, he's got to meet the threat. If he didn't have a threat, he would continue passively. The threat for white is serious. White threatens king b4. Black plays a5. Now, from the study of this position over several years, I've learned that white should not play any pawn moves on the queen side unnecessarily because they will only end up helping black. So, for example, white should not play a4 or b4 or really any pawn move on the queen side. It's unnecessary to move his a and b pawns at this time because if white does so, then black will have chances of trading off pawns on that wing and activating his rook. I mean, let's remember that black's biggest problem is that his rook is passive and white's rook is active. And the whole approach to this ending should be the notion of activity versus passivity, good versus bad, which we discussed in another lecture, and having role-playing for your opponent. For example, the rook on b8, its role is to guard the b7 pawn. White wants to put black's pieces into such defensive roles. Now white could play king to b3, threatening king to a4 to b5. Black must stop this threat, and the natural way will be for black to play b5. Now white can simply play king to c2. He returns. Black has stopped white's plan of entering on the c5 square and then to d6, but white can now switch to an entirely different plan. What is the plan? Well, I said there were three factors. The better rook, the better king, and the better pawns. And that is indeed the plan I have for white now. It's for white to effect the move e4 in such a way that he creates a duo and gets a big center. Black will find this difficult to cope with, and white, in effect, will get the better pawns. So now let's continue with black's play. Maybe black plays g4, white plays f3. Now, does white need to play f3 right away? Not necessarily, but he does need to play f3 sometimes. And the reason I played it now is I didn't want black to get as far as playing h4 and maybe h3. White would have been able to effect this plan with f3 and king d3. I've tried many permutations of these moves with audiences, and the conclusion is always the same. White wins. It's just black can put up a better or worse defense. Okay, now again... Black, if he plays f5, would be met by rook h7. So let's say black trades. Takes, takes, and maybe black plays king up to g7. Now white plays king to d3. And everybody knows what we're going for here. We're playing for e4. And white will create a duo and then get the second type of advantage. We know the white's king is already a little better than black's king, but the white king is not dominant yet. And white plays e4, he'll be threatening to win a pawn right away. White should never, an important principle in this ending that 
that I've learned also is White should never relinquish the dominant position of the rook on c7 just to gain a pawn. Two pawns, fine. If you can win two pawns, then your rook can let the other rook out of prison. But one pawn is not enough. Or if you win a pawn and you see a queen coming quickly after you win a pawn, okay, you might let the rook out of prison. But otherwise, you don't. And an interesting thing that has happened now in this position is that the play is shifting from the seventh rank to the fifth rank. That is where black's pawns are on the fifth rank. So white just played king to d3, and sure, black has various different defenses than the one that, uh, you know, he could play king to f6. This is one possibility. And now, white could play e4. And this is when the game kind of becomes critical, because black here could let his rook out with rook to g8. And I don't know if I really find that e4 was perfect in this position, because now the black rook is active. I think that a better move, in fact, returning, instead of e4, was for white to play rook to c5, or to prepare rook to c5 with king to e2, and not let the black rook into the game. Now uh, black will be a little more hard-pressed, to get counterplay. He can still try to play h4, h3, that type of idea, but it's not going to be that easy for him. And white should be able to get play on the c-file with rook to c5 and win the queenside pawn. White is also threatening e4, as I mentioned. And black is in a kind of passive position here. If black continues in a passive way, Let's see what would happen. He plays king g6, we'll play king d3, then king f6. Now, we could start the action that I mentioned with rook c5. But again, most accurate would seem to be for white to play king to e2 to stop black from getting his rook in on the g file after rook to g8. Now, each time you play through these sequences, you learn something. Maybe it would have been better for white not to allow black to open the g-file with the f3 idea that took place. And white could have anticipated black's g4 and played this position somewhat differently. But let's continue. Black plays king to g6, and now white plays the rook to c5 idea that I mentioned. And black, funnily enough, cannot play king to f5 because e4 check wins a pawn. The king would be pinned. So black continues passively, and we're just looking at the worst case type of scenario, and white now plays e4. And now black is indeed in trouble. And I hope everyone understands why black is in big trouble. Because all of his pawns on the fifth rank are in some pressure, some attack from the white rook. Starting with the pawn on d5. And black, even if he plays, let's say he plays a sensible move like rook to d8. Okay? Now white plays king to e3. The purpose of king to e3 was simply to guard the d-pawn. And now black is again in serious trouble. And any attempt by him to get counterplay on the g-file, I can assure you, would be too slow at this point. Because white has a lot of pawns that he's going to grab on the fifth rank. Let's try black plays d e F E. Now this is a typical position in this ending from my study of it. White has achieved the duo in the center, the D4 and E4 pawns, and white threatens to play D5. But again, more importantly, there's black pawns hanging 
all over the place. And I suppose Black would really want to keep the B pawn because it leads to the A pawn more than anything. So Black may play rook to B8. But White now grabs the H5 pawn, and White will continue to improve his position with the concept, again, of better king, better rook, better pawns, and now White has an extra pawn, which will lead to victory. Again, it's too late for Black to try rook g8. Rook c8 would also not be sufficient. It might be a good idea here for White to meet rook c8 with rook c5, not to take the b pawn, but just offer a trade. That's the big trump you get when you have these dominating factors. In this particular case, the simple fact that White is up a pawn allows him to offer trades that Black cannot accept, and Black now must take a passive role. Perhaps Black's best here would be to play Rook H8. And here, again, White has a choice. White could play Rook to C2, but then he's likely to end up with a passive Rook, although he is up a pawn. Or he could play rook takes b5, rook takes h2. Now black's rook is out of prison, but white has a pretty strong position here with excellent chances of winning. I think white would now want to play a move like a4 and try to then get a pass pawn and technically win this game. Once again... Let's remember where we started. We started in a position where White only had the better rook. We ended in a position where White had the better king, the better rook, and the better pawns, and an extra pawn to boot. That's the goal of playing these kind of rook and pawn endings. I hope that you have enjoyed this flash video on rook and pawn endings. Hi, this is Grandmaster Damien Lemos. First of all, I hope you enjoyed um, this video. If you would like to receive more free chess videos from us, you can just click the subscribe button below. I would also highly recommend signing up for my free mail course, The 10 Grandmaster Secrets to Dominate Chess. During this exclusive course from OnlineChessLessons.net, I'll share with you my own Grandmaster shortcuts to effective attacking, defending, and growth hacks to improving your chess without uh, complicated books or memorization. So sign up by clicking the sidebar on the right, and I know you won't be disappointed. Once more, this is Damien uh, for OnlineChessLessons.net, and I'll see you um, in my videos. Thank you.